Hey, Browns fans, Maurice Hurst here. Just signed back. Extremely excited to be with the squad for another year. Hope you guys are ready for some belly rubs. It's about to be a great season. Go Browns. Welcome to the Dogs Podcast with your hosts, Blake Reniker, Justin Charles, and Josh All. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Dogs Podcast presented by Omaha Steaks. Josh All with you today, and I've got St. Patty's Day themed Kenny Mac attack from Canada. Kenny, how you doing, man? Top of the morning, lads and lasses. Doing well. Can't wait for the day. <laughs> All right. So show everybody the, the shirt you got on because it's not just uh, a leopard cover, random leprechaun. Uh, St. Patty's Day yeah. shirt. It's uh, it's uh, our uh, Elfie, Brownie the Elf, and he's all ready to go <laughs> just like myself. So thanks to GV Yards for uh, making this bad boy, man. That is one of the coolest shirts. And it was funny because when Kenny sat down, I've got my Brownie the Elf podcaster <laughs> shirt on today. And I, we didn't plan that or anything. But as soon as I saw him, I said, oh, I forgot to wear something green at St. Patty's Day. But I'll let Kenny go ahead and take all the festivity and he yeah. can represent the Dogs Podcast on St. Patty's Day. That's right, man. Let's go. Let's go. So today, yes, we've got a very fun episode prepared for you guys. We each brought three NFL draft prospects who the Browns have already had some sort of meeting with. So these aren't just, you know, random draft prospects that we like, that we want the Browns to draft. These are actually guys from the list of players the Browns have already met with in person so that means there is a little extra added interest by the browns for these players now obviously every year they don't just draft guys they meet with they draft guys they scout guys they evaluate people that they may not expect to be available when they're on the board are available so they take them all that kind of stuff happens but they definitely do every year select one or two guys that they've met with so kenny and i have each picked three from the list and we're going to go back and forth and present them to you guys so before we dive into these draft prospects if you're on youtube guys like and subscribe we are getting closer and closer to 9,000 subs on youtube so help us get there and if you're listening on audio thank you very much apple podcast specifically scroll down to the bottom of our homepage on the app and leave us a five-star written review those really help out the show all right kenny do you want to kick things off with your first guy yeah, I'll just say one thing about the picks that uh, they met with so far. I don't know if you noticed since I sent you the list. Um, it was high in offensive tackle. It was high in uh, receivers. Mm-hmm. It was high in um, running backs. And generally, that this draft is going to be really good for offensive players, uh, especially uh, the receiver position is the deepest. You're going to have a high end of uh, tackles. And there's going to be uh, value uh, in the mid rounds for running back. There's a couple others like defensive end and some players, but that was the main um, uh, focus for the Browns. I saw with the players that they met so far, and then we all noted that they'll meet with players once they uh, get through all the different um, uh, player days at the pro days at the um, colleges, right? Mm-hmm. So I'll, I will kick it off. Uh, my first guy. So this is a bit of a reach, but it's not a reach uh, negatively. It's going to have to be like a positive reach or we're going to have to do something to get this guy. And my guy is Troy Franklin. Okay. And basically I find him super intriguing. And uh, if you guys noticed the last time that Josh and I met, I like to look at bigger, faster, stronger. Okay. And um, with this guy, He's intriguing because, man, he's definitely bigger, so he's a taller dude. And uh, he's definitely faster. He's got the 4.4 speed. But stronger, we'll we'll get into that. And um, as far as his last season, I mean, this is fantastic. Imagine if a guy was lining up for the Cleveland Browns. And at the end of the season, the guy had 81 receptions for 1,383 yards. And he had 14 touchdowns. That would be fantastic. And that's how his 2023 season ended. So overall, when you take a look at this guy's season 
and the, the last three that he did, you're seeing incremental improvement, which generally, if you hear Andrew Barry, that's what he wants to find, right? So the yards, I mean, that generally happens no matter what. So 18 for 209, then he goes to 61 to 81, and he goes 81 receptions for 1,383, like I just mentioned. But here's the biggest things that went up. The touchdowns, 2 to 9 to 14, which is awesome. But that was based on a rate of uh, yards per catch where he went from 11.6 to 14.6. And, man, if he averages 14.6 for us, I'll be happy this year. And then he went to 17.1, which is dynamite. That will be a very, very large um, uh, yards per average in the NFL to have, right? So on the PFF big board, he is the number 40 ranked um, player. And then now I, I went through a different different teams to see who they kind of compared him to. I know this is what one's going to make you cringe because we spoke about this for free agents. They kind of compared him to uh, Marquez Valdez Scantling. Yeah. So if you take a look, yeah, I know. Uh, if you take a look, though, Scantling's six four and he's two oh six, but he does run the uh, he ran a four three in the combine. He runs about a four four right now. Um, so he is six uh, two listed on NFL.com. But he came in at 176 pounds. So now the Bleacher Report, this is pre-combine what I found. They had him at 6'3 at 187. So he somehow lost some poundage somewhere along the line, or he just never was that way. But great, great numbers for the combine. So 4.4 speed. He's got a 1.6 in the 10-yard uh, split, and then a 39-inch vertical. So for that, that killed the combine for him. So he's on a lot of radars, and as the number 40, 40th ranked prospect, you would if he just gets drafted for you, that's a day two uh, pickup. But I mean, with that that speed, that vertical, and the split, uh, you might be looking at him a little bit higher into the first round. So where are they comparing him, or who are they comparing him to, other than uh, Marquez there? So Darius Slayton, he's six one, he's one hundred ninety pounds. And he ran a 4-3 on his combine. Also, you're going to love this guy. OH, baby. And what do you say? I-O. I-O. Yeah. Chris Olave, six foot, 187 pounds. And he ran a 4-3-9 as well. So close to a 4-4. So this is what I like. This is what NFL.com is saying about the guy. Franklin might not be a number one target, a number one receiver target with volume. But he should be productive. And his yards per catch average and the ability to open things up underneath for his teammates is going to be great. Franklin could become a coveted complimentary piece for an established receiver one. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like what we've been talking about that the Browns need? Mm-hmm. Basically, yep. if you just want to hear the Coles notes of this, he takes the top off the defense and everybody gets it open. Is what you're what you're hearing about this, right? So again, they're going uh, number one vertical target that should instantly help a passing game. This is exactly what we wanted from Anthony Schwartz, and it just didn't materialize. So he's not just a speedster. He's quick afoot, and he's a detailed runner. And this is where we kind of get into comparisons about Chris Olave. This is exactly it. Kind of, the guy's got a slight frame too, so I can see that uh, comparison. So, and what they mean by a detailed route runner. So he's constantly throwing different releases at running backs. So while you're saying in your head, wow, he only measured 176 pounds, he's throwing different ways to get off the line of scrimmage, basically. He's also got a good understanding of how to uh, manipulate a defensive back. So if he tacks one shoulder, defensive backs are trained to hit him up in a certain way, he will immediately go for the other shoulder. So he was constantly keeping defensive backs guessing. He almost never runs routes the way that the defensive back's going to think that he is. So he's always keeping them guessing. So that's going to help him get open. Now, it still remains to be seen, like, can he beat NFL coverage? That's a big thing. So in this deep receiver uh, class, he is a top 10 pick anywhere I've seen. So that's good for the Browns, maybe bad to draft him. But he's around the 6 7 mark. So generally, what I hear is a consensus is a day two pick, low first round pick. So if he can overcome these physical coverage limitations and uh, excel at the point of catch, then that puts him up in the top five category. So what I like the most, 
and what I really want for the Browns. If it's not him, this is, these are the things I want to see. Elite deep speed, so he's got that. Zone recognition, ball tracking, and the route running. That's Man, how many times have we heard this for Stefanski, right? So the concerns for, with him basically playing through contract, functional strength, and contested catches. So the functional strength is big, so we didn't get stronger with this guy. I don't even know if he lifted, to be honest with you, at the combine. I couldn't find anything. So that's not good. That can now lifting and form and strength that can like, that's what strength coaches are for. This guy should be able to do something with that. So overall, my opinion, he's a 40th ranked player. How the Browns get him is going to be a trade or for some reason, teams get scared off of his uh, slightness. But basically the only way that he falls, like I said, it's the weight. But I think the speed dictates that he gets in the first round. And I don't know if you get by the Bills. I don't know if you get by the Ravens. And I don't know if you get by the Kansas City Chiefs. Somehow, if that goes, then we might have a chance. But I think he'd be a great fit for the Cleveland Browns. I agree. I like Troy Franklin a lot. I know a lot of NFL draft uh, scouts are really, really high on him. They've risen on him. I think his pro day or his uh, combine had some mixed results. Some of the drills he ran left a little bit to be desired, but... You know, one of the stats, and I've, I've been posting this on Twitter over the weekend that I really look at for these wide receivers is yards per route run. That just kind of shows because targets targets are an earned stat. If you're a good route runner, if you're good at getting open, if you're a good wide receiver, your target share usually indicates that. But then what are your yards per the routes you are running? And you like to see receivers kind of in that top 15% of the nation in that stat. I mean, top 25% is pretty good. Troy Franklin was easily in the top, I want to say 3%. He was sixth overall in the country at 3.32 yards per out run. So the dude is very, very good at getting open, creating some separation. And I know you mentioned like MVS and some of these names that are a little the, the comps are a little worrisome, but one that I've heard more recently that I like better is Devontae Smith for the Eagles. You know, he came in, I think he was like six foot, 175, so just a little bit shorter than what Troy Franklin is, but same kind of situation. A slender guy, everybody was concerned, can the weight hold up? And what you're seeing in the NFL right now is a move toward smaller receivers, quicker guys, because the NFL is running, and I've said this multiple times, 70% zone coverage on average on the defensive side of the ball. So strictly lining up outside, out physical your man and beat him deep. That is not really the game right now. The game is can you win consistently in the intermediate areas of the field? And I think that's where Troy Franklin, Troy Franklin can also excel. Yeah, I, I loved it too. You guys posted something about the um, the yards on, uh, I think it was two days ago on the uh, on Facebook that I caught it on. And and you listed a bunch of receivers and you left out, because you were doing uh, realistic targets, and you left out Franklin. And one guy, do you remember Jared? Yep, the very I, first comment, yep. First comment, what about Troy Franklin? And I was like, oh boy, I want to <laughs> say, hey, I got something for you on Sunday, yep, buddy. Stay Let's tuned. Go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Troy Franklin, I love that pick and definitely is going to have to be, it would have to be a trade up. We would have to do something, make some sort of move. And I think it would definitely depend if he's slipping toward that back end of the first round. If the Browns feel like there's a chance he's coming into the second round, maybe we see it on day two, but we'll see. We still got a lot of time left in the draft process. So a lot of exciting developments can unfold. Yep. All right. So let's move over to my first guy. I do have a wide receiver in my list but I'm not going to give them to you yet. The first guy that I'm talking about is offensive guard Javian Cohen from Miami. So nice. Cohen is six foot four, 324. I couldn't find an accurate like age on him, but I was looking at his years. His freshman year was 2020. That was the COVID year. So he's probably a little older, like a lot of the current prospects are anymore just because of that COVID year. So he's probably 22, maybe going on to 23 years old. Started college at Alabama, transferred to Miami after earning second team All-SEC in 2022 when he was at Alabama. So not bad at all. He played left guard all of college, but I've been reading scouts think that he could also fill in at tackle if needed. He, This dude played a lot of snaps in college. 1,395 pass block snaps. And you know how many sacks he allowed in his whole career? 
one. Girl. Ah, Just days. one. So right now he's being projected in the third round. He's definitely in play for the Browns. He's at a spot where they could de- they could get him for sure. Scouting reports cite he has great footwork, lateral agility, ability to mirror his defenders. They say he's an explosive puller, has a high football IQ. I've seen that in multiple places about him. Sure. His athleticism is a big thing. It makes him operate best in space. He's very good at pulling to the second level, working through double teams, and he does very well at sealing off defensive tackles on outside zone plays. So here's one thing that really did stand out to me. Scout said in pass protection, his football IQ is on full display. When he's facing loaded boxes, they say he's constantly keeping his eyes moving to identify and pick up free rushers. So he sounds like a great young guy that the Browns could bring in at that guard position because we know that Joel Batoni, I think this is the last year of his current contract. He's 33 years old. Don't really know too much about the future of Joel. He is getting older could be looking to retire at some point here in the next couple of years. And Wyatt Teller is also on a, they're both on large contracts. So I think it's about time the Browns figure out that interior offensive line position a little more long-term. Some yep. of the weaknesses that I read for this kid had to do with mechanics and his physical strength, strength at the point of attack. But those are all things I expect a good offensive line coach like, uh, Dickerson, Isvan, I expect these guys to be able to coach him up, obviously get this kid on the team strength training and all that kind of stuff. But the intangibles all seem to be there. I didn't see anything about him lacking effort or attitude issues being any sort of concern with him. Overall, everything just says he, he's a great athlete. He's very athletic, very capable guard, could become an NFL starter with some good coaching on just you know some of those things I talked about. The, the one sack over three seasons as a starter, that that gives me DeWan Jones, Luke Whipler production kind of vibes from Ohio State. They went their whole careers. I don't think they gave up any sacks between the two of them. And I read an interview actually from JV and Cohen, and this is from the senior bowl. He said, quote, I'm a plug and play type of talent. I can start right away. I can play in any scheme. I'm one of those guys that you can depend on to get the job done, rain or sunshine. I'm always reading opposing defenses. I have a positive attitude about the workday. I'm excited for anything and everything that comes my way, and I'm very coachable. So, of course, you know, you kind of take those responses with a grain of salt, knowing these guys, they're all trying to improve their draft stock, so they're going to try to say the right things. But I like the high energy that he brought. I like the awareness that everybody was talking about with him. You know, he mentioned that he's a dependable guy. That's supported by his stats and what all the scouts are saying about him. And when I, you know, if you look at his NFL draft profile rankings, production score was 10th overall among guards in this class. Athleticism score was 8th overall. And I just think JV and Cohen would be a great addition to the Cleveland Browns offensive line of the future. Yeah, I'm glad you brought him up because, I mean, we all do our mock simulators and we we post them. I keep mine just to kind of see, like, who keeps coming in the same uh, area. And I got one question for you. Where is he expected to go draft-wise? Do you know or do they kind of divulge anything? Because some guys, it was easy to find where they went draft-wise. Other guys, you really had to, like, pry it out or he couldn't find it. I've been seeing third, fourth round for him. Okay. Yep. So, the and the, the reason why I'm asking, because I constantly see him coming in the sixth round in the simulator and no wonder i'm getting like b's and a's on this because this has been (laughs) a fantastic pick right but i have noticed that he always seems available around a pick and i keep meaning to go hey i gotta check this dude out you know and i've seen him linked many times uh, to the browns so let's see what happens yeah and i know maybe you're watching this listening to this episode saying well i mean if he's a fourth round pick can he really be that great? Well, I, Wyatt Teller, I believe, was a fifth-round pick, correct? Yeah. So yeah. you you can find very good starting players all throughout the draft, and I do trust Andrew Barry to find that sort of talent because that's what he's shown over the years now is every pick, a home run, slam dunk hit, of course not. But every pick, for the most part, contributes to the team in some way, shape, or fashion, whether it's developing into a starter, a solid contributing role player, a good depth piece. And I, I saw somebody post something on Twitter about Andrew Barry, you know, his draft from 2020 isn't very good because only like one of the, one or two of the guys is still on the team. And I said, yeah, but they all played out their rookie contracts here. How, ma- well, how many draft picks don't even make it into year two or, you know, let alone year three with their, the team that drafted them? The percentage yeah, has to be pretty, pretty damn high. 
pretty standard for most teams, though. If you go four years back, who's still really on the team? Nobody. Exactly. Like, the so, other thing that I'd want to touch on, and basically what you're saying is finding these gems or like these mid-rounders. Really, the league, I think they, what, what's, what do they say about the league? It's made up of 20, 30% uh, undrafted free agents. You got to turn over every stone, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, you do. And I mean, Dewan Jones was a later pick last year. So yep. these guys, kind of guys are available. And these are the kind of names you have to be looking at with the Browns, especially because you know we're not going to get one of the top tackles or guards or anything in the first or second round. I mean, I guess they could take one in the second round. But there's just there, there's guys all throughout the draft, and it's fun looking through the names. And the Browns made it a point to meet with JV and Cohen. This episode is brought to you by Omaha Steaks. Browns fans, Easter is almost here. And what's everybody going to do for Easter? We're all getting together with family and friends, and we're going to have a great meal together. So why not make that great meal the best meal you can get with Omaha Steaks? They are doing their 50% off site wide sale right now still. And if you go to omahasteaks.com slash dogs, use promo code dogs, D-A-W-G-S, when you check out, you'll get 30 extra dollars off your order. That's a great deal with the price of meat and food and everything. So high right now, it's ridiculous. Get over there, get great food for great prices. And what I would suggest for Easter, go over to the menu, scroll down to other meats, go to the hams. And when you get in there, scroll down. I don't know why they have this stuff at the bottom of the page. Easter packages right here. Build your own custom Easter dinner for four. Build your own custom Easter dinner for eight. Create your own Easter dinner in general, get everything you need. The ham, the the sides, everything that you need for a great Easter meal is right here at Omaha Steaks. And with that code DOGS, you get $30 off your order. So go order everything for Easter right now. That way you're ready to go, you're prepared, and you don't have to worry about it. Enjoy Easter with your family. Take the stress out of figuring out what you're going to do. Get the food ready to go now. OmahaSteaks.com slash DOGS. Promo code DOGS. Get $30 off your order. Minimum order may apply. Like getting into like, you know, um, undrafted free agents. I, I don't know where my next guy is going to fall, but it's kind of like um, we were just talking about Dewan Jones. Dewan Jones, we had to draft him. He just has freakish um, uh, like size and freakish strength. And you can't pass up on that. And so one thing that I've learned in listening to Daniel Jeremiah goes, you never pass up on that stuff. And what I've found is the Ravens, they're, they've always picked like the biggest, strongest dudes. And so my next guy is Aiden Robbins and uh, he's a running back. And part of the reason that actually I picked him is because I thought you were going to pick Audric. <laughs> and uh, Audric, the, he, he, cause you guys posted him. I thought, oh, Josh going to pick this guy. So it's almost going to be like a comparison. And so that dude, he's like 5'11, he's uh, 221 pounds. He runs a 4'7. But the guy I picked, I mean, when you put his picture out, dude, I thought he looked like Miles Garrett. I think you guys even said, man, he looks like Miles Garrett uh, in that post. Um, yep. But man, the metrics on this guy, if you guys take a look at this dude, uh, 240 pounds, man. Boom. I can just hear that guy hitting other dudes on the field right now. And he's got a six foot frame. So, I mean, originally I was going to say he's Audric light, but he's not because he's heavier. <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean? So that is a bad comparison, but, uh, I still want to keep going with this, this guy. So he was like a double transfer. So he started at, you know, sorry, started at Louisville. And then he went to UNLV and then ended his uh, last year at BYU. So, uh, and I I was at a UNLV game and we were watching the running backs and some really good receivers. And I remember talking to you, dude, and he said, oh, you had to see the running back last year. And then as I'm going through the list, I'm running, I'm running through all the guys. I'm like, oh, this must be the dude. This must be the guy he was talking about. Just a guy that was knocking heads on the field. So. What happened, though, is when he was at BYU, though, he was uh, plagued with wrist and rib injuries. So he wasn't as productive as he could have been. Uh, so he finished with 485 yards, 4.8 yards in attempt. Um, but here's the biggest thing. Uh, he got into his last three games, and kind of like when we were talking about Aaron Jones for the Packers last year, he averaged 100 yards per game at 6.5 yards a clip, which is amazing. The other thing is he had a super valiant Oklahoma. So uh, against Oklahoma, he had a 182 yard effort. So mm -hmm. finally he was, you know, feeling good. He got all the plays that he needed to be. And he was, I guess he got his football strength 
and football stamina under him. So he looks really good. Now this this uh, BYU team, they put out other guys in the last like five years. They put out Tyler Ajir and they put out uh, Chris Brooks from my uh, from the Dolphins. So they're both slightly smaller and they have slightly slower forty times. So if you're bigger and got a better forty time, I think you should be looking at this guy. And everywhere that I've looked, this guy is considered a draft diamond. So this is who that's all met with a guy: the Bears, the Packers, the Colts, Jaguars, the Bills, the Chiefs. The Raiders, Saints, 49ers, Browns in New York. Wow. So his his breakout season, though, was with the running Rebels that this guy was telling me. So in 11 seasons, he had 109 yards. He had nine yards touchdown, nine yards rushing, and one yard receiving. So now you've got to ask yourself, why did this guy always transfer? Because that's got to be a red flag to some people. To be honest with you, he wanted to play against better competition. Mm -hmm. For the first Mm -hmm. time ever in BYU history, they played 10 Power 5 schools. So he said, I want that challenge. Unfortunately, the challenge didn't happen because of injury, and you can't fault guys for injury, right? Now, after everything that I've said, what does this kind of remind you of? It reminds me of the way that they picked said Tillman. (laughs) At a monster junior year, and he also had a... uh, um, uh, injury plagued senior year, right? So I'm hoping that the Browns can capitalize on this um, guy because it doesn't seem to be, be going to maybe even hit the top 250 for PFF. So maybe this is a guy that we can sign right after the draft's over. Um, mm. I like his size, man. Like I said it before, he runs a 4.5 to 4.57, and he's a fourth quarter beast. As he goes through the game, he gets stronger. What I dislike about the guy is this is like a big Eddie George thing that nobody liked about Eddie George coming out runs too high. But what I've seen in his like watching his actual uh, footage is his actually first hit is low. He breaks through the line of scrimmage. Then he starts to be a long strider and runs high Um, for this guy. I honestly think he's going to be a piece of clay that do Staley can mold. I looked for the number of 240, the backs that weighed 240. Other than Derrick Henry coming out of Alabama, the other guy that could find is like uh, Leonard Fournette. So if he's somewhere like like 70% of those two guys, I mean, I'd be pretty happy with a guy that's 240 and can run a 4-5 on the Browns. Yeah, I think I would be definitely okay with that too. And I like what you're talking about as far as Aiden Robbins being available later in the draft potentially after the draft could be another undrafted free agent gem. I think the one spot, like the main position where you see the most undrafted players get an opportunity and succeed at least maybe early on in the career is the undrafted running backs. And do I mean, do yep. you agree? Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. Okay. I, I like this kid. I was looking into him as well whenever we started putting notes together and stuff to do this episode. And I thought, whenever you said you were going to talk about Aiden Robbins, I, I, I said, okay, I'm going to hands off this because I really like him. I think that I think that has some serious potential for the Browns. Oh, absolutely. So speaking of serious potential for the Browns, I'm going to talk about my wide receiver now. And I know this is a guy that a ton of you out there have mentioned and you've shared about him online. You've commented. When are you going to talk about this kid? I'm going to talk about him right now. This is Malik Washington, wide receiver from Virginia. And I know he is rising up draft boards, but there's a lot to go through with Malik Washington. And it all starts with this. He is five foot eight, 190 pounds. Okay. So at the combine, ran a 44740, 1.53 10 yard split, 42.5 inch vertical. 10 foot, six inch broad jump and had 19 reps on the bench press. All right. So you're probably saying, Josh, why are you bringing up a five foot eight slot specific receiver for the Cleveland Browns? If the Browns would decide to go with a guy like JV and Cohen a little earlier in the draft, like third round ish, maybe they go O line in the second, maybe they take like a linebacker in the third or whatever they decide to do, they pass on wide receiver with the second round pick. Maybe they pass with, on wide receiver at the third round. Malik Washington right now is projected as a a day three pick, so the Browns could grab him maybe in the fourth round would be a nice spot. Maybe he even slides into the fifth round, and I think it's going to be very size-related because the height 
Definitely a knock on him. But the dude is 190 pounds at five foot eight. That means he is built. His BMI, like it is great. He, compare him to who you just talked about, Troy Franklin, six two one. What was he? One seventy five. One seventy six. Yeah. One seventy six. Tall, slender. This guy is short and stocky. He is very built. But according to everything that I'm reading, his size complements his mental and physical toughness and his football mechanics on the field. He has excellent ability to create separation, quick changes of direction, very tough to cover. That compact size helps him maintain great strength and balance. I keep hearing over and over one thing about him, contact balance. He gets the ball in his hands. He gets hit. He stays up. He's got very good leverage. He has got great control over his quick feet, and that leads to very precise cuts and moves when he's running his routes. He has strong hands. I've seen that from every scout. He extends his hands to the catch point. So he's not trying to like body catch all the passes that are thrown to him. You know, body catches that that can lead to breakups, deflected balls, things like that. So he's he's a high pointer. He likes to go get the ball. And you like to see wide receivers typically who are early declares. It means they were able to dominate older defenders in college. This is maybe a negative on Washington. He is a fifth year senior. He's already 23 years old. He's going to turn 24 late in his rookie season, so he is an older prospect. I know there's concerns about his ability to run against good press corners at the NFL level. Shorter arms, obviously, that minimizes his catch radius. He's not a very good run blocker. Scouts don't think he can offer much on special teams. So Vince. those are kind of some of the reasons why, despite all the hype, production, which I'll get to in a minute, I think he's going to be available later in the draft. But anybody out there listening to this right now, if you love Malik Washington, if you've been screaming this whole time what about mm. his production so i saved the production for last because it was awesome in 2023 so you talked about oh, right. you talked about the 1300 what was it 1381 yards for troy franklin yeah malik washington 1384 yards in 12 games he had 138 targets caught 111 receptions 80 percent catch rate like i said 1384 yards 12.5 yards per reception, nine touchdowns, only dropped three passes on 138 targets. The first wow. game of the season, he had just 29 yards. And then after that, he was over 100 yards the next straight 11 games. There was one one week in there where he was at 97, but close enough. I'm going to count that. That is His production was off the charts. Of all the wide receivers in the country or in the draft class, he had the most missed tackles forced. 35. So that's that contact balance I was talking about. Right. That means yards after the catch. His yards per route run, 3.15, which is a fantastic number. Like I talked about with Troy Franklin, that was the 11th highest in the nation. Puts him in the top 5% of wide receivers in that category. And all the scouting reports just say he's small, but he has an alpha receiver mentality on the field. There's nobody tougher. He's got a total winner attitude. He wants the ball. He wants it in the biggest moments. So this is a dude who thrives under pressure in the big spots. He was asked uh, in an interview if any of his meetings with NFL teams stood out to him, and he actually mentioned the Browns as one of the nope. teams that stood out to him in his meetings along with the Raiders, Panthers, and Chiefs, which this guy on the Chiefs I think could be pretty dangerous too. Yeah. Right now I'm honestly reading about him, watching some of the tape. I'm getting vibes of a stronger, more physical version of Tank Dell. Tank Dell yep. came in last year, 5'9", 5'10", but just 165 pounds. He came in at 23, turned 24 during the season, same type of thing. And I think that Malik Washington has all the mechanical, all the mental tools to be a stud at the NFL level. I know we like the bigger bodied receivers, the guys like, or, or some, you know, these other receivers, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, of course, these guys can dominate on the outside and inside. But like I said, the NFL is playing 70% zone coverage on average is becoming more and more important. you got to have these receivers who can consistently win and dominate the intermediate areas of the field. you got to be able to make guys miss after you get the ball in your hands, gain yards after the catch, and that's what Malik Washington does. Man, man, that sounds amazing. And I know this guy's been a bone of contention in the Discord. As I not, I think this is a – Gage wants us to get this guy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the sound bite right now. Hot dang. <laughs> that was that is unreal what you just said and uh, you know what i get the tank dell comparison you know what i hear steve smith mm, steve okay smith yeah here. 
where, especially with the nastiness attitude. Like I kept hearing you say, I, and every time I hear you talk about it, I'm like, man, he's smaller. The only thing that he doesn't have that Steve Smith does, I believe Steve Smith actually made the Carolina Panthers because he was a special teams ace as well. Oh, so he could okay. ball. So if this guy can't, whatever, I mean, if he can somehow figure to get open and beat press coverage in the NFL, sounds like he can find some seams and he can go, man. So that sounds amazing to me. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just looking ahead at the Browns and what could potentially develop throughout this season and into next season, not trying to look too far ahead, but we always have to have a mind toward the future. You know, the Browns have Jerry Judy now and Elijah Moore, both on the end of their last year of their deal. So are we going to be re-signing both of those guys? Are they both going to produce at a level where we want to bring them back? I'm hopeful for Jerry Judy, Elijah Moore. I like the player, but I think that a guy like Malik Washington could come in and immediately be the same type of role on the field that we want Elijah Moore to do. But I think that with, obviously we would get him on his rookie deal. So we'd have four years of him cheap and I really do th- this guy's mentality and I was watching highlights of him and watching through some plays and some games he man the route running is on point and what he does with his feet to throw off the defenders he gets open as soon as he gets that ball in his hands like I've seen a couple plays where he gets smacked and stays on his feet and then he turns on the jets he might not have top end speed like some of these other prospects but again right. you're not asking him to line up outside and go you know a nine route and beat anybody get the ball in right. this kid's hands, let him break a tackle, and then he can go. And I was, I got very excited watching watching highlights of Malik Washington. Yeah, no, no doubt, man. It sounds amazing. Hey, if the guy's like a little bowling ball, like, let's, let's do it, you yeah, know? Yeah, let's go. This episode is brought to you by Danger Coffee. Browns fans, we talk about how Danger Coffee is made free from mold toxins that are in 45% of the world's coffee, but that's not all that Danger Coffee has to offer. Mineral and nutrient deficiencies are a big deal. They make you feel sick, tired, stressed, and they can give you brain fog. These deficiencies negatively affect your immune system, your digestion, sleep, metabolism. Have you ever wondered why you get an initial burst from your coffee? but then you get that little crash not long after, Danger Coffee's patent-pending process remineralizes your body with more than 50 trace minerals and electrolytes, leaving you more energized, engaged, powerful. These micronutrients enter the cells to boost performance. They bind to toxins to provide detoxification support. I know that sounds like a lot, but the bottom line, guys, is minerals matter. And most of us really don't get enough of them on a daily basis. Danger Coffee delivers micronutrients, plus it gives you access to the minerals you already have. Head to DangerCoffee.com, use our code DOGS, D-A-W-G-S, for 10% off your order. And that code can be used over and over, so you get 10% off every order you make using code DOGS. It's time to start every day off with a cup of coffee that gets you going and actually keeps you going. DangerCoffee.com, code DOGS. All right, I'll get my last guy and I'll tell you one thing. So my last pick is a homer pick, okay? (laughs) This guy is from the home and native land. It's offensive lineman uh, Gabe Wallace. So first of all, just from the name, if I go Gabe Wallace... Sounds like he plays for on an offensive line, doesn't he? That sounds like an offensive lineman's name. Sure does. And, uh, he's uh, he's like the former uh, game day host, uh, Nate Burleson. They're both from BC, so that's Canada. And uh, he's um, a, a homer pick for me. And if if you could just pick an offensive lineman based on size, I, I got these numbers. Uh, the CFL had their combine, so I had to get most of my stuff uh, from him from there. But he's a mammoth. So this guy's 6'6", 340 pounds. Mm, Holy crap. Okay. That's a big dude. So you compare him, and I will uh, in a little bit. Now, the speed, though, I had a hard time finding. So in one of his profiles, and I can't remember what the draft uh, thing was, but he was anywhere between a 5'17 and a 5'38. So I don't know if I misunderstood that because he ran a 5'7 at the combine. So it's not quite as fast. However... When you're looking at offensive linemen, the 10-yard split is very important. He won, He did a 188, which is respectable in the uh, in the offensive lineman world. To, to compare, the big kid out of Georgia, he did a 178, right? And he's, okay. a, he's a top five uh, draft pick or top 10. So he's very, very versatile. And I expect for him to either go sixth, seventh round, or maybe even another undrafted free agent. And um, he played every position except for center. 
He oh. played on one of the better uh, lines in the MAC conference. And we know the MAC, like it's not Big Ten, it's not the SEC, but they constantly churn out players. I mean, Roethlisberger played there. We had um, uh, Alex, not Alex Mack, um, uh, or Khalil Mack uh, come out of there as well. But the big thing about O line, and you, you said this uh, when you were talking about O line, it, 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 and it's any any guys really in the NFL in the uh, NCAA. It's game started. Listen to this: his graduate year, played twelve games, so five games as a left guard, and then he moved and finished for the remainder of the season at left tackle. Uh, he made the All Mac third team, and uh, which allowed for the fewest sacks in the Mac. Senior, uh, thirteen games, all at left guard, made the All Mac third team again. Number one offense. Or what are the better offenses in the MAC? Junior also played. Oh, I just made a mistake. Junior played twelve uh, games as well, so he's got a lot of games under his belt. They averaged four hundred yards of offense and one hundred ninety-five yards uh, per game uh, rushing. So who has he met with? He's met with the Browns. He's met with the Chargers. Met with the Cowboys. Met with the Bears. He met with the Vikings, Bills, Steelers, and the Washington Commanders. In an interview with him, he said he got the the warm and fuzzies, mainly from the Eagles and the Dolphins. Um, he is a hard-nosed offensive lineman. He can really propel a team forward. He loves the dirty runs. He loves grinding out tough yards in the line of scrimmage. Um, he doesn't care much for the spotlight. He just wants to help the guys win. So it's kind of funny, though. If you ask him what he's best at, he says he wants to play guard. If you ask NFL scouts, they want him to play uh, tackle mm -hmm. right so where are we here, here now so improvement so his knees a little bit better pass pro uh, uh pro technique which maybe anyone could use in the draft uh could be seen as a more of a blind side protector so they're looking at uh left guard or left tackle and he would based on his size right right needs to be a little bit more consistent and uh, doesn't uh, hit with the second hit, they usually say. So he gets he's pretty good with the first hit of contact, but the second he doesn't get to. The biggest thing that I like for the zone scheme that we run is that he has an easy way of getting to the second point of attack. So he's getting the first blocker, or say he's getting through the first uh, his first block, and he's hitting the second line. Is basically what I'm hearing from his... Um, scouting reports so who is he comparable to well if i'm just going on height weight and i'm going on um 40 time so jc uh, latham from uh alabama and just so i, I want to be clear of this i'm not saying he is that guy and is going to be that guy right away what i'm saying is they're both 6'6 six, six with 340 pounds and in the high end of one of the times i found he ran a 531 and that's what i'm saying so if if our new offensive lineman can mold him and we can get anywhere close to what JC can do, I think that's a win-win. So he's bigger, he's stronger, and uh, faster we'll see what happens. But I will say that he is faster just because he can get through that second wave of uh, attacking uh, defend defenders. I, I definitely think the Browns are going to be looking for offensive linemen in this draft, and I'm glad that you brought him up. Because did, did you say what round kind of projected? I would say six, seven or okay. undrafted. So these later round guys, potentially undrafted guys that the Browns could end up with. This is huge for us because we don't have, you know, after the Jerry Judy trade, we don't have a ton of picks. What do we have? Five picks now, yeah. I think. So, yeah. you know, we're going to have to be a little more selective. They brought in a Denigy for the, you know, in free agency to kind of, Phil, I think he can do guard, a little bit of guard, a little tackle, whatever the Browns really need him to do. But we definitely need to be looking for the future of the line. I think that Andrew Barry, we talked about this in a, a previous episode, he learned from him his mistakes. And I yep. think one of his mistakes was drafting James Hudson because Hudson did not have a lot of experience playing offensive line. He was a defensive right. tackle, converted over to offensive line, did okay, in that last year in college at Cincinnati, but he did not have the background, the extensive experience that these guys that we're talking about now have. And I, I would be surprised if he made that same mistake again. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And I, I liked what you were saying previously about our offensive line. We just need some young talent to uh, develop. I think he's got the right pieces again, along the lines of saying the same thing about uh, Aiden is uh, just 
let's mold this guy. I mean, I see like we were talking about our draft picks. I have him up. So round six, we're picking 206. That might be a little bit high for him. I can see us picking him at uh, 243, though. Okay. And uh, uh, signing him as a rookie free agent, uh, we never know. But I mean, I think it gives us some versatility because he's played all the um, offensive line positions other than center, you know? And we know how much the Browns value versatility, that flexibility to be able to put guys in different spots, especially later in the draft. We're not, we're not going to be drafting or potentially signing an undrafted free agent in Gabe Wallace saying, we think that, you, you know, we want you to be our starter. That's not the idea, yep. guys. The idea is to get good quality, solid depth on the offensive line because we don't we have some depth but we don't have a ton of it right now and we need to start building that a little better and this could be one of those pieces for sure yeah oh yeah absolutely like we're not like you're just to touch on what you're saying we're not part of that decade of decadence anymore where we needed every single draft pick plus hopefully a couple free agent gems to start for us like this guy is gonna you know be a uh something that we could mold the other thing is is like once you get past the the uh, second round of uh the draft the offensive tackle does drop off a bit and uh just time constraints i didn't see if anybody near the sixth and seventh round are 240 pounds and six six you know that's uh that's stuff that you want to bank on because you can't teach that size and and uh weight no i mean and strength matters because these pass rushers on the defenses right now these guys are just monsters just freaks of nature and that's why yep. dewan jones was such a great pick because he had that basketball background the dude right. is 375 freaking pounds of of body that's a lot to move but he knows how to move yep. his feet he's got quick feet and he can shuffle and that's what makes him such a damn good tackle yep <laughs> all right so i'll wrap things up here with my third guy my final my final player for the Browns, and you know, Kenny did the Troy Franklin. We might have to reach a little bit, maybe trade up to get him. This is my pick that's similar to that, and this is a guy that I wasn't necessarily <clears throat> like the highest on at the beginning of this whole process, you know, a month or so ago. But as things have unfolded, the combine, reading more about him, and it's <laughs> the funny thing is, this is a position I don't really even like for the Browns to draft anywhere mm -hmm. high but i think this kid's an exception and it's braden fisk defensive Ooh. tackle out of florida state he is six foot four 292 pounds a little bit on the lighter side but he has a high high motor good run defender good pass rusher so to find a defensive tackle who can be very very good at both of those things it's not easy to do and if the browns can find an offensive lineman like JV and Cohen in the third. Maybe they grab Malik Washington later in the fourth or so. Braden Fisk is on the board at the second round or anywhere close to where they're picking in the second round. They can move up a little bit to get him, kind of like they did with JOK. I think you go get him. This dude knows how to use his explosive first step to push back blockers, establish the line of scrimmage. He's got great power, great strength in his hands. He uses that for effective rip club moves. Um, he, I've been all the scout. He's he's an excellent gap penetrator. He gets upfield and he disrupts the backfield. Again, he uses great hand power, moves to rush the quarterback. He's got above average lateral movement, allows him to redirect and maintain pursuit and pressure against mobile quarterbacks. Very important because we've got Lamar Jackson in the division. Now we've got Russell Wilson and Justin Fields, and Joe Burrow yeah. can move too whenever he needs to. So a guy like Braden Fisk who can quickly redirect, maintain pursuit and track down these mobile quarterbacks, that's going to be key. It really is. Now, some yep. of the things they say he needs to work on his pad height level during some plays. That can allow offensive linemen to gain leverage on him. He's super aggressive when he's penetrating and getting into the backfield, but it also, he needs to harness that a little bit. That negates some situations where he just straight up blows by players in the backfield. But I think it's easier to coach discipline and harnessing a player's aggressiveness than it is to teach a player to be aggressive, wouldn't you say? Yeah, oh, absolutely. So absolutely. with these defensive tackles, you see a lot of guys, like I said, they're either bigger bodies, they're more of a run plugger, you know, a gap stuffer, or you see the more athletic types who are better at rushing the passer. And you kind of use those guys in inter, you know, intermixed roles. But with Fisk, you get a guy who can do 
both. He's a great athletic interior pass rusher who can also penetrate and plug gaps against the run. He had six sacks in 2023, eight in 2022, 21 tackle for loss in his last two seasons combined. With how the Browns are approaching the defensive tackle position, right now they've got a cemented starter with Dalvin Tomlinson, and he's in just the second year of his four-year contract with the Browns, and then they're rotating these one-year deal contract guys alongside of him, and I think Fisk would be the perfect fit to start off in that rotational, kind of situational role as he's learning and getting up to speed. He can rotate with Mo Hurst, Shelby Harris, Quentin Jefferson. I I hate projecting cap stuff too far ahead, but if you get a guy like Braden Fisk and he proves that he can be an every-down type of player, there is cap relief to be recouped down the road if the Browns would decide to move on from Dalvin Tomlinson later you know, in his age 32 season or whenever, not this year, obviously, maybe not next year, but eventually. And then you're just hoping, as a side note, Siaki Ika can develop into the role that, you know, we're bringing in Jefferson and Harris to play. So if you've watched this show for any length of time, you know I'm very hesitant on drafting defensive tackles. It's a very tough position to evaluate. It's a tough position to transition from college to pro. In college, you know, sometimes you're facing a team that doesn't have any of their offensive linemen who are going to go pro. And sometimes you go up against maybe one or two pro potential offensive linemen. But in the NFL, you are facing all guys who are pro-level talent, and that's where players at the defensive tackle position struggle because you can't just very easily do what you did well in college and just have the same success. So there's definitely a learning curve. But Braden Fisk seems like the kind of player, his demeanor, His mental makeup, his attitude, his aggressiveness, speed, athleticism, strength, those things could all combine to make him a very, very good defender at the NFL level. Yeah, when I hear you talk about him, I hear Jim Schwartz just go, like, I can hear him pumpernickel. He's just like, Mm -hmm. yes. Yep. The other thing that I kind of hear is ultimately when we were speaking about Perrion Winfrey before we drafted him and minus the attitude issues, it was a lot of the same thing. And uh, a slighter player that could pass rush that play the defensive uh, tackle position. So I would really like that to recoup that loss that we unfortunately had to cut him and um, uh, have that guy in, in our back pocket for these, um, uh, what do they call them, the Jaguar packages? Uh, where we have like guys that can rush the passer on third down. Like I think that would be an awesome mm-hmm. fit. And then, like you said, let's see if he can progress and get a, a full-time starter. Yeah, definitely. And honestly, this just everything I've read about him, watched and, and listened to scouts and all that stuff, he just feels to me like the type of player who can come in It might start off a little slow, you know, his rookie season as things go, but by the end of the season might be in a – 75% role, you know, snap count role on the on the defensive side of the ball because I I think he's I think he's going to be very good. I just I get good vibes from him. There's not a lot of defensive tackles that I research and look into and scout that I come away saying, "Oh yeah, I can see the path for this guy to be a pro bowl level talent." But this guy, I think this guy's got pro bowl level talent built in. I really do. Does, does he like there was a guy Carlton Fisk? Is that is that are they related in some way? Does he have any NFL pedigree? I'm not sure. I'll, I can look that up real quick. Yeah, because like I mean, if everybody wants to know, I pulled up last year's uh, list of who we met at the combine, and the guys that doubled up are here. So we doubled up post and after their pro days. Uh, so Dewan Jones, we drafted him. Dorian Thompson, we drafted him, and then uh, we also did oh uh, Tank Dell. And Tang Dow's a guy that we didn't get. And I like the I like the mm. pick of uh Malik Washington, man. That sounds like something like boy oh boy, like that. We didn't get him last uh Tank Dow last year, but we could get a player like that this year. That one I think sticks out to me the most uh from your three guys. Yeah, and you know, Tank Dell obviously has already proven at the NFL level the dude can play. This guy can play, he can he can play with these NFL players. He's already gotten injured. That smaller, that's one of the things that I hear all the time with these smaller bodied receivers, the the under yep. 510s, the under 180 pound guys, can they hold up? And while Tank Dell produced, he also got injured. Now we've got sub 510 Malik Washington, but he's 190 pounds. And you got to think he comes in, he puts on maybe a little bit more muscle in an NFL training program. Maybe he gets a little closer to that 200 pounds. I'm not so concerned about the 5'8". It's the fact that he can... I've seen... Go watch the highlights, guys, if you haven't. He takes hits. And he, if he if he gets tackled and taken down, like on a hard hit, 
bounces right back up, number one. Number two, he gets smashed a lot by guys and stays on his freaking feet and keeps going. It is pretty cool to watch him play. You know what? Based on what you're saying, we're going to call half the nickname him Tank. Yeah, <laughs> I think Tank if would be better him. for him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, and no, Carlton Fisk and Braden Fisk are not related. Their last last names are not spelled the same, so. Oh, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> I, I was wondering. I, I threw that was kind of like a, a shot in the dark. Braden Fisk has an E at the end of his Fisk. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. It, it stands for elite level potential. In my gotcha. <laughs> yes. <I am> not- <laughs> <laughs> so drop in the comments, you guys watching. If you're listening, I think on Spotify you can comment. So and and we see those when you do. So drop us some comments. What do you guys think of these prospects the Browns have met with? Are there anybody, any other prospects that were on the list of of guys that the Browns had meetings with, whether it was at the Senior Bowl, the East West Shrine game, the Combine, or you know, just even a digital virtual interview, whatever it was, who you think would be a great fit for the Browns, a realistic get, and where they could possibly get them. So we really, we really appreciate everybody watching and following and engaging with the show. And I think before we wrap things up, Kenny, this is the first time I've had you on the podcast since your big news with the Browns backers. So do you just want to? Just yeah. tell every, take a minute, tell everybody what's going on. Yeah, so basically with the uh, Cleveland Browns, what it is is you have Browns backers worldwide, and that is the organized uh, fan club that the Browns support. So that club is supported by chapters throughout the world. I have the Ottawa Browns backers chapter up here in Ottawa, Canada, and I oversee that one. Now, while we have all the chapters, there's a group of 10 people that oversee all the chapters and help uh, be like a liaison between the chapters and the Cleveland Browns. And I am on that President's Leadership Council, and I was able to get a nomination for the vice president of that council. So I will be the vice president this year, and I will be the president going into 2025. So I'm super stoked to help anybody who's a president or any Browns backer out there. You can always... uh, Reach out however you want, ottawabrowsbackers.com. I'm here to listen to you and uh, make every season as a fan fun. Uh, and no, I don't have any say in who the Browns draft or free agency <laughs> or, <laughs> or any insider information at all, period. <laughs> no, but you are doing what what our podcast is geared to do from the very beginning, which is just bringing Browns fans together from all over the place. We have our own. You, you go to jointhedogs.com. Kenny's in there. We That's how we got to know you so well in the first place is in our yep. Patreon group. Join the Discord. That thing is a 24-7 conversation place. It is so cool. And I'll just kind of throw this out there right now on this episode. We are having conversations about test running, beta, you know, beta testing, a Discord dog pack chat live on YouTube next i guess it would be this coming saturday evening maybe for an hour or so where the discord guys are going to get in there it, we're going to have it run and hosted by Devonte travis and yep. we'll just kind of see how it goes if, if if there's good interaction and people enjoy it we'll, we'll try to do maybe two or one or two of these a month maybe and see how it goes but there's just all kinds of great things going on with browns fans what you got going on is awesome and we're really happy for you congratulations and yeah definitely reach out to kenny if you've got any questions or anything he is an awesome dude to get to know and and to talk to yeah yeah hit me up on facebook it's ottawa browns backers if you google that it's super easy to find you can hit me up on twitter and all the other uh, socials that are out there that's awesome kenny i really appreciate everything you put together for the show today this was actually kenny's idea by the way guys to to do a show where we talk about prospects the Browns have met with and I thought it was an excellent idea because it gives you a good insight into guys they're a little more interested in than just you know the average prospect who they have not met with I thought it was awesome Kenny I I love you appreciate you and anything else you want to say before we wrap it up no man let's enjoy our St. Patrick's Day have one for the Browns let's go brownies (laughs) <laughs> that's right all right so happy saint patty's day everybody and until we come back to you guys we got a live show on tuesday this week i believe with blake and justin and actually kenny's going to be you're going to still be in studio for the draft right day two draft night yeah live coverage yeah, I'm, coming, I'm hoping to hit up the draft on uh round one hang out with some uh browns backers so i will be down there so come and say hi 
I'm going to head on down to Dover for day two, and then back to the draft in Detroit on day three. That's crazy. So you got a lot of travel coming your way, but it's going to be a ton of fun. We've got a little over a month until the draft, so I'm sure we'll have Kenny on an episode before then, but I just want to mention that we've got stuff coming up, so just YouTube, like, subscribe, tap that notification bell so you don't miss any of the updates that we've got coming out. You don't want to miss the stuff we're doing. So until I talk to you guys again on Tuesday night, let's go Browns. Let's go Brownies. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Dogs Podcast. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at The Dogs Podcast. Get your thoughts on the show at thedogspodcast.com.